Chapter 23, the digestive system, part two. So moving on to the stomach. The stomach, the first organ of the gastrointestinal tract found in the abdomen. It is directly below or inferior to the diaphragm. It is anterior or in front of the pancreas. And in it lies between the spleen on the lateral side and the duodenum on the other side. And it's sort of a J-shaped pouch. The stomach's functions include mixing the saliva and food with the gastric juice. This mixing forms a slurry known as chyme. So chyme is when we take the bolus and mix it with the gastric juices. During this process, we get both uh, mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. Also, of course, the stomach has to secrete the gastric juice, the gastric juice which contains hydrochloric acid and the enzyme pepsin. So the stomach could be broken up into four regions. The region directly after the esophagus is known as the cardia. This superior hump here is known as the fundus. The bulk of the stomach is known as the body. And then the tail end of it is the pylorus. So again, cardia, fundus, body, and pylorus. And then, of course, the very end of the pylorus is the pyloric sphincter, which controls the movement of the stomach's contents into the duodenum, which is the beginning of the small intestine. Within the stomach, uh, you also can see all of these little ridges or folds. These are called the rugae. They are part of the mucosa layer. And basically, they're there because, as we know, the stomach is able to stretch when filled. If you look at the layers of the stomach wall, we see that the mucosa is lined with simple columnar epithelial cells and possesses these little pits called the gastric pits. Within the gastric pits are the cells that secrete the hydrochloric acid and the enzyme pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. So the beginning of the chemical digestion of proteins occurs in the stomach. The submucosa layer is as expected, and then the muscularis layer in the stomach actually has three layers of smooth muscle tissue. So the stomach is the region of the gastrointestinal tract with three layers of smooth muscle tissue. All right, moving on, we have the pancreas. Pancreas, as we know, is posterior behind the stomach, stretching between the spleen on the lateral side to the duodenum. The pancreas uh, produces a lot of substances that it secretes, and the pancreatic into the pancreatic duct, and then the pancreatic duct connects with the common bile duct coming from the liver and gallbladder, and then the combined secretions of these structures enter the duodenum. So the pancreas produces the pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice is alkaline or basic in nature, and it neutralizes the acidity of the chyme coming from the stomach. So the pancreas produces the pancreatic juice to neutralize the acids from the stomach. The pancreas also secretes a lot of digestive enzymes. These digestive enzymes will break down lipids or fats, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. It turns out most of the chemical digestion of food occurs in the small intestine by chem enzymes secreted by the pancreas. Uh, inflammation of the pancreas is known as pancreatitis, and it can be very painful. And then cancer, as we see here, cancer of the pancreas uh, is usually fatal because it is usually not detected until after the cancer has grown very large and metastasized to other parts of the body. Uh, we have the liver. Here is the liver. It is directly inferior to the diaphragm. It is more on the right side, upper right side of the abdominal cavity. Uh, the, on the inferior surface of the liver is attached the gallbladder. The liver produces bile, and the bile is sent through the common bile duct down to the duodenum. There are a variety of blood vessels carrying blood to and from the uh, liver. This includes the hepatic artery, hepatic artery bringing oxygenated blood to the liver. 
It also includes the hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein is carrying blood from the small intestine to the liver. This blood is rich with nutrients. So most of the nutrients absorbed by the small intestine that enter the bloodstream go directly to the liver. And then uh, the blood from the hepatic artery and hepatic portal veins get mixed together, uh, go throughout the liver, and then eventually leave the liver through the hepatic vein, which then goes to the inferior vena cava. Functions of the liver include synthesis and secretion of bile. Bile is the substance that aids in the breakdown of lipids or fats, uh, basically by causing the big globs of lipids that will form because they're hydrophobic to break up into teeny tiny globs that are eas more easily exposed to the enzymes to break down the lipids. Acting sort of like how soap acts. Say you have a greasy pan, you add some soap, and it'll break up the grease easier. The liver also has a lot of functions with nutrient metabolism. It uh, stores and releases glucose. It uh, stores and breaks down fats as well. It breaks down amino acids. This is what leads to the production of urea, a waste product. And it stores and releases some vitamins. So this is part of the reason why nutrients go to the liver first, because it will pull out the nutrients it is supposed to store and or process. Uh, the liver also processes some drugs and toxins. So another good reason to have the uh, materials coming from the small intestine go straight to the liver. And the liver also activates vitamin D that then gets sent to the kidneys. Inflammation of the liver is known as hepatitis. Usually when we talk about hepatitis, we're referring to viruses causing the inflammation, but it can also be caused by drugs and chemicals. Uh, hepatitis, the viruses, there are actually five different kinds, A through E. The gallbladder, the little sac attached to the inferior surface of the liver, the gallbladder stores excess bile. So the function of the gallbladder is to store bile that is then released when food material enters the duodenum. The gallbladder can develop gallstones. Gallstones are crystallized cholesterol. And these stones can potentially block the gallbladder uh, preventing the flow of bile from the gallbladder to the duodenum. This can lead to pain, severe pain, and infection. And if this is a chronic problem, then the gallbladder will be removed via surgery, and that's called a cholecystectomy. cholecystectomy. Small intestines shown here. These coils of the gastrointestinal tract actually make up the longest portion of the gastrointestinal tract. This is where almost all chemical digestion and almost all absorption of nutrients occur. Uh, there are three regions to the small intestine. You have the duodenum, which is a short C-shaped curve coming directly after the stomach. Then you have the jejunum, about three feet long in the upper left area of the abdom, abdominal cavity. And then the ileum. Ileum is the longest portion, about six feet long, found primarily in the lower right part of the abdominal cavity. And the ileum ends in a sphincter called the ileocecal sphincter that controls the movement of materials from the small intestine to the large intestine. If you look at the wall of the uh, small intestine, you see that there are many changes to the mucosa. The mucosa has these large lay, uh, push structures pushing out into the lumen, known as circular folds. Um, then if you look on the surface of the circular folds, you'll see these smaller finger-like projections known as the villi, many villi, one villus. And the villi are lined with simple columnar epithelium. And then if you look at the actual simple, simple columnar epithelial cells, they have small projections called microvilli pushing out into the lumen. And the point of the circular folds, the villi and the microvilli, is to increase surface area. To, that will then aid in an increased absorption of material, of nutrients. Turns out that within each of these finger-like projections, in each villus, is a structure called a lacteal. This tube-like structure is part of the lymphatic system, and it is the lymph vessels that carry absorbed fats uh, to the uh, body. So the lacteals are carrying the absorbed fats, the absorbed lipids. 
Also present among the simple colon epithelial cells are cells that produce mucus. Again, lots of mucus produced along the gastrointestinal tract. The remaining layers, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa, are as expected. Functions of the small intestine include chemical digestion of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Segmentation. Segmentation is localized mixing of the material in the small intestine. This is a form of mechanical digestion, just moving the food material back and forth, back and forth between certain portions of the small intestine. Of course, peristalsis, which is the movement of the food material along the entire small intestine. And then absorption of about 90% of the nutrients and water. Large intestine. Large intestine is wider than small intestine. It basically sort of wraps around the small intestine, running along the borders of the abdominal cavity. And its inferior portion passes through the pelvic cavity and ends in the anus. The first compartment is known as the cecum. The cecum receives the secretion, the materials from the small intestine. So that those materials pass through the ileocecal sphincter. Ileocecal sphincter, small intestine, cecum. And the cecum is one single pouch. Hanging off the cecum is the appendix, which is about three inches long. Each individual pouch by itself is known as a hostrum. So the large intestine has lots and lots of hostra along its length. Uh, the portion on the right side of the abdomen is the ascending colon, colon carrying the feces up the abdominal cavity. It makes a 90 degree right turn and the feces will enter the transverse colon going from the right side to the left side of the abdominal cavity. It makes a 90 degree downward turn and the feces will go down the descending colon when, where it rises to about the level of the uh, hip bone. And then it'll enter the sigmoid colon, sort of a, a S sort of shaped curve there. And then the sigmoid colon gets to about the midline of the body and then becomes the rectum. The rectum is the last eight inches of the uh, large intestine where feces is stored until it is released via defecation through the anal canal and out the anus. So the feces travels through the anal canal and out the anus only during defecation. Functions of the large intestine include hostile churning peristalsis and mass peristalsis, moving the feces through E. colon, the large intestine. Bacteria, it is a place where many bacteria live. These bacteria do things like break down amino acids, produce vitamins, and just take up space. So pathogens can't live in the large intestine. Large intestine also absorbs water, ions, and electrolytes, and some vitamins. Feces is formed here, and of course defecation to get rid of that feces. Disorders can include diarrhea. Diarrhea is when the Frequency, volume, and fluid content of the feces is greatly increased due to a liquid feces being expelled. Uh, then there's constipation. This is infrequent or difficult defecation. This is caused usually by decreased movement or motility of the enlarged intestine, causing the feces to stay in the body longer and becoming dry and hard. And then, of course, colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer, here's an image of it on the large intestine extremely deadly. Um, that's why at a certain age you're asked to get a colonoscopy every, I think, two years to try to detect palps, palps that are precancerous growth so those can be removed. And that is it for this lecture.